And from there, my whole like being was just open and everything just started to click and make sense. There's just so much conditioning around accolades and setting goals and achieving them. And it's all based on some outside perception of us. I like thinking about like, how do we start to redefine the game and redefine the rules? If we can just check in with ourselves by asking a couple questions about how am I feeling? What do I need if it's something like that? I know that's big in my journey. It's because the only way that we can operate at the pace that we operate at that causes burnout is disconnection. I am Andrea. I am the event manager here at Remotely, tuning in from Bucharest, Romania. And I will be your host for today. I'd like to give you a warm welcome to our ecosystem and thank you for joining this gathering. And I would also like to give you a swift introduction to our two speakers for today's gathering. Sam Cambert is a successful serial entrepreneur turned spiritual seeker. He is known for his ability to put together teams to execute the vision. He is the author of the number one best-selling book, Soul Life Balance, he has produced nine podcasts and hosts a food show on YouTube highlighting family-owned and operated restaurants in Silicon Valley. After realizing that despite his success, he was unhappy, he is now on a mission to help spread awareness around positive practices to tackle depression, sitting with discomfort, and exploring the cause of unhealthy patterns, as well as sharing standard, standard tactics to practice mindful living, which can be found in his book that I will drop in the comments in just a few seconds. Founder and CEO of Gromotli, Sarah is a remote work advocate, leadership and conscious expert, ser serial entrepreneur, professional speaker, and author of the book Conscious Leadership, A Journey from Ego to Heart, which was the number one release on Amazon. And I will also be dropping this in the comments soon. She is now fueled by a deep passion for sharing the power of conscious leadership and remote work and with, with other leaders and playing her part in redefining work for humanity. I would like to thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, well, I will start with Sam for now. You are the author of the book Soul Life Balance, which addresses the very topic that we are, that is the center of the discussion today. Can you share with us how your personal journey brought you to this concept and then writing a book about it? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Andrea. Well, so like you mentioned the bio, serial entrepreneur did all things, lived in Silicon Valley, and I was chasing success so much so that I wrote a book called The Written Goal, which was all about the mindset behind writing down your goals so that you can actually achieve your goals. And around the time in 2017, I launched my first podcast, re relaunched that into a media network with five different shows on the podcast. It was called What Up Silicon Valley. That was the media network. We had monthly events and mixers for young professionals. We had an annual event at eBay's headquarters called Pitch Tank, which was a Shark Tank inspired event. Needless to say, with all of that, networking with the who's who of Silicon Valley and interviewing the movers and shakers of Silicon Valley within the podcast. And it was through all that that really was the catalyst to building a million dollar business while also working less than four hours a day by kind of very similar with remotely, remote workers and the difference between grow remotely and what I was doing back then and even what I'm doing now I should say is working with freelancers and virtual assistants versus like remote professionals how grow remotely does it which both are great right it's just different needs depending on your size and scale so anyways back then scaling doing all that wrote my first three books in a year the first one was about freelancers and virtual assistants and all of these things really was what led me to ultimately being named to Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list, which is just a list of like movers and shakers and influential business leaders in Silicon Valley. And around that time, I started to notice that every time I achieved the goal, 
I didn't, I couldn't receive it. I couldn't celebrate. I couldn't be happy about it. It wasn't enough. Like, you know, for the Silicon Valley 40 under 40, which is a massive recognition list. I it's still, I struggle with it. It's like, well, if Zuckerberg's not on that list and all these type of people, then it's a BS list because who am I? Right? Like this is Silicon Valley. So coming up with all these reasons why I can't actually achieve it and then going out and achieving a bigger goal. And a lot of these things and these, the subconscious programming of not feeling enough wasn't something I was really aware of. I knew that there was something going on, but I ignored it. I used distractions with, you know, whatever it be, my addiction to football, watching football, being part of fantasy football, my addiction to work and content creation, all of these things. And then through a numbing depression in 2019, which really the trigger for that was breakup, uh, an on on and off again relationship that lasted four years. And when it was finally off, that was the thing that, you know, kept me up at night, had that my mind racing all the time. And around that time is when I discovered breath work. And I went to a breath work ceremony, a breath work journey, like 60, 90 minute long breath work session, just you and your breath. And I literally felt reborn. And right after that, plant medicine known as ayahuasca found me as well. And then I sat with the medicine and from there, my whole like being was just open and everything just started to click and make sense. And then from there, back in 2019, ever since then, I've been going down the path of initially self-discovery, but it turned into more a journey of remembering as things started to unfold. And what I realized in hindsight, as I started to do the work, the inner work was the subconscious programming of not feeling enough and my addiction to work really being like chasing that dopamine hit. And as soon as I get that hit, it's, it's like the, it's gone, it's fleeting. So on to the next. And one of the things I discovered in, you know, my, my yoga practice, which I got into yoga, like consistently in 2018, and I obtained my yoga teacher certification in 2021, I believe, was the yogic philosophy of sadhana, which teaches us to be in pursuit of. It is the cliche saying of the journey is the destination. And one of the most powerful things that I learned back then was that this saying right here, to name your ultimate potential is to limit your ultimate potential. And when I heard that, it really blew my mind and it resonated deep within because really for me, for years, I looked at being named to Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list as like my ultimate potential with actually not like actually saying, oh, that is my ultimate potential, but that's the way I approached it. And then when I achieved it, it was like, wow, I thought I'd feel different. And what it, I've found and many of us have found is like when we achieve these massive su successes that we've just been like, man, if I can do this one thing, then I'll feel good. It, it's like goal setting, right? When I achieve ABC, I will feel X, Y, Z. Well, it's not true, right? So sadhana and your ultimate potential, just leaving at ultimate potential is all around creating the habits and routines, the ways of being, the things to be doing on a weekly, a daily and weekly basis, which is the whole practice of soul life balance. So to answer your question, I know that was a lot of context, but soul life balance is a reframe of work life balance where we realize that the reason why we're facing this massive mental health crisis is because we're disconnected from our true authentic self and our inner world and knowing what it is that we want. So that's why it's soul before life while recategorizing re work as part of life. I mean, we can even see the, the conditional programming of society to put work-life balance, work before life, not life-work balance. And I could keep going from there, but I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you, Sam. There's a very rich sharing. Thank you for that. I want to move to Sarah, who also wrote a book, Conscious Leadership Journey from Ego to Heart, who basically, basically has somehow the same principles that you are talking about in your book. How was your journey and how did you came to write a book about it? Yeah, I mean, I can relate to everything that you shared, Sam, and my journey has been really similar and it feels like it kind of keeps going as well. Like, you know, I feel like I've just been through another iteration of this same experience and so much of it comes down to like am I worthy am I enough how do I be enough for this world and there's just so much 
conditioning around accolades and achievements and setting goals and achieving them. And it's all based on some outside perception of us, which I think really only we know what success means for us, what peace, what harmony means for us in our lives. But yeah, to answer the question, I think more specific, I mean, you asked me about coming to the place of writing my book, I think was a lot of, I also had, I had a breakdown in 2018. So coming off the back of this career of just more, 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 do more, be more, achieve more, (laughs) also a relationship that kind of was really challenging. And when that started to fall apart, I also sold my last company before remotely at that time and kind of everything started being stripped away and falling apart. And I went through this kind of breakdown, emotional breakdown type experience. And then that was a point in my professional career where I I did have another company at the time. And I had to say to everyone, like, I'm, I'm tapped out. I need to take some rest and just do your best that you can do. And I'd already been on a bit of a journey of empowering people and learning what that looked like. But during that period was another giant leap forward of understanding how we can work together in in better ways, in ways where we really acknowledge that we are all valuable, whole people whose opinions and perspectives matter and who can make decisions and be trusted and that extending that empowerment and trust actually changes the way we get to show up as leaders and, and company owners or CEOs or bosses, so to speak. And, you know, part of that journey was really like resigning from that title as boss and, and seeing myself as, okay, one of my areas of responsibility in this company is to be the leader, but that doesn't mean I'm the boss of everyone. Like everyone kind of is the boss of themselves. So all of this journey of deconditioning of even what hierarchical structures within companies looks like within what work you know, what, how work should be and realizing that it's actually much more fulfilling for us to all to come together around a collective vision and mission and a set of values and just to trust ourselves to operate in our best ways toward that, that vision and mission. So that was really kind of the journey that I went on from there into kind of 2019. And then I wrote the book in 2020, right at the start of COVID. Ironically, I think with the journey of Gromotely, you know, it was another, it's been another layer of forgetting and remembering some of that, you know, had a lot of pressure to build this really huge company and do all of these big things. And I I saw toward the end of last year where I suffered more burn and just this stress and pressure that I thought I had shared before, realizing that once again, I was still in this trap of like trying to be enough for everyone, for our entire ecosystem of Gromotely to try to be enough to be worthy to and carrying all of that burden and shouldering all of that responsibility. So going through it again a second time was a little different because I do feel I had more of the observer perspective where I was able to witness myself and I couldn't necessarily always get out of it, but I was able to see like, wow, like you're still stuck in this same past patterning that, you know, if you need to be enough for some external group of people or for this world so yeah that's just it's just an interesting time in my life because I've just been through another round of burnout that I'm recovering from and reprioritizing how I think about about work and what I do in the world and putting that soul front and center again thank you since you both kind of talked a bit about work-life balance so soul life balance seems to put together to put another question mark on the concept of work-life balance. Do you think we should retire the concept of work-life balance? Yes. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And did I cut you off? Sorry about that. No, no, no. That's the question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'll get into the archetypal energies real quick and I'll call it yin and yang or yin and yang. Sometimes in spiritual communities, we'll talk about the archetypal energies of masculine and feminine, but Oftentimes in a more businessy corporate type setting, try to leave that outside of it and just equate it to yin and yang or yang. And the yin energy is about fluidity. It's really about reception. It's about creativity. It's, it's really intuition, right? It's our connection to our world within, whereas that yang energy is our expression in physical form. It's our five senses. It's actually being here and it's structure, right? So another new term that I'm rolling with these days, in addition to soul life balance is structured flow. 
because so many of us want structure, right? And we also want flow. And when we talk about structure, that's that yang energy and flow is that yin energy. Well, if we look at work-life balance, we can so easily see that work and life both require that yang structure energy. And the question becomes, where's the opportunity to connect within? Where's the connection with that yin energy? Where's the connection with flow? So for me, I do feel like it is a distraction mechanism to talk about work-life balance as if it's like, you know, we glorify being weekend warriors, right? It keeps us not asking questions of, wait, why are we working eight to five? Wouldn't it make sense to like, what, first of all, what are we working for? Look at the industries we're in. Like, I mean, I'm not going to blast my industry, but the business I've had for 13 years, the longest business I've had is in the promotional products, the branded merchandise business, and it's afforded me a great lifestyle. I'm very, very, very grateful. I don't have negative feelings towards it in terms of it being wasteful because when my clients ask for a cheap item that's going to land in a landfill, I call them up and I say, hey, let's do something else, right? So that's my attention to it. However, I did have this experience in a medicine ceremony when a client was debating over to get like a North Face or Patagonia jacket, right? And I was actually outside wrapped up in a blanket. And I was like, man, how many jackets and sweat, just reflecting, right? How many jackets and sweatshirts do I have? And then what is this about like having a label that says North Face or Patagonia? Like who cares, right? So when I talk about like what is work for and the industries and things like that, so many times we outsource our I'll say sovereignty or our own happiness to a brand. And my role in doing branded merchandise, you know, I have conflicted feelings about that. And it's something that I've been trying to transition out of. Having said that, went on a rabbit hole and a tangent there, bring it back a little bit. Work life balance. Yes, to answer your question, I do believe we need to retire it because it adds to more of just not feeling enough, needing to outsource our own happiness is the easy way to say it. And I do believe that if we, if we replaced work-life balance with soul-life balance, we would all have increased mental well-being. And I'll add as well, this isn't for my own ego and like my name attached to it. The way I view this movement is very similar to how Simon Sinek became so passionate about start with why. Now, when we hear about like, what's your why and all this type of stuff, some of us will associate Simon Sinek with it, but he doesn't care about that. He just cares that, that people know why they're going to do something. And that's the same way I see this. Like, I, I don't care. I don't have an attachment of people being like, oh, Sam Cavert with Soul Life Balance. No, not at all. This is about the collective well-being. And if we can replace work-life balance with Soul Life Balance, then I know we are all going to increase our own mental health. And a lot of it is just going to be by people asking questions and be like, soul life balance, what does that mean? What does that mean to me? And then that's when they start making their own changes in their life versus talking about work-life balance and you know, saving up for retirement, PTO, vacations, coming back from a vacation, needing a vacation from your vacation and all that type of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. Like we almost needed this work-life balance movement as like a stepping stone to soul life balance because it was the first like concept, I suppose, that allowed people to think about how they were prioritizing work within the greater context of their life. However, I think a lot of it came down to like trying to create this perfect pie of like, you know, I work out for this amount of time in the day and then I, you know, do my work for this amount of time. And then I make sure I have time for my children and my relationships or whatever it might be for us and my hobbies. And it was still a lot of that structure and a lot of this, like, oh my God, am I like carving it up perfectly every day? And it was still separating out work as this necessity. Like I have to go do the thing to make the money so that I can have this life over here. And one of the concepts that I was and maybe like phrasing, I suppose that I was more interested in was like work-life integration, where work becomes just like an integrated part of life because you're actually doing something that you love and something that you enjoy and something that you care about. And then it doesn't even feel like work that much anymore. And then going further from that, it's like, can we break down all of these conditions in conditionings and structures around it having to be nine to five or eight to five or 
freaking eight to eight to eight a lot of the time or whatever it is. And does it have to be done in a certain place with a certain group of people? And that's where we get into all the remote work stuff where the the passion that I have for that is like, you know, I get to live in Austin. We have land, we're building a community and potentially still do this work in the world that I care about, but from a place and with people that is more peaceful for me and, you know, more beautiful for me. So it's like, can we bring localization back to our communities and our lifestyles while still doing work in the world because we can find the company and the mission and the vision that's most aligned with us. So yeah, it's it's really interesting, but I think that the idea of soul life balance is a lot more, it's taking it to a new level. And I really honor you, Sam, for talking about, you know, your own conflict with your own, the industry that you're in. And I think that it's so important for us to do that. And it's a journey. You know, we're not, not going to sit in one ayahuasca ceremony or wake up from one dream or have one epiphany maybe and change everything. I mean, sometimes we do, but oftentimes it's just like, shit, I'm sitting with the fact that I don't necessarily 100% align anymore with the work that I am doing in the world. I don't necessarily, or not even just work, like how I'm living, like how do I stop perpetuating something that I can feel in my heart is no longer in alignment. It's not serving for humanity. This is very much a journey I've been on over the last year, especially. I feel like since the pandemic and it, it's been deepening, I'm reading a lot of Charles Eisenstein's work and his term is interbeing, but really stepping in and understanding that you know we are everything. We are the world around us. So whatever I do every day does have a ripple effect. So you know, if I'm ordering Amazon and getting a bunch of packages delivered to my door and everything packaged up in plastic and cardboard and five different boxes every day. And yeah, great. I'm recycling. So that's just a fucking distraction to make me feel better about the fact that like I'm consuming at this rate and supporting an organization that I don't potentially, yeah, potentially agree with or align with either. And starting to look at like every area of my life, not just the business I'm in, the work that I do, but how do I come back slowly or as fast as I can, I suppose, to more harmony and actually understanding that everything I do is, you know, that thing I order is one day going to end up in landfill if I don't maybe make different decisions and better decisions. I've started using like thrift stores and online marketplaces to find things that I need because I would rather it not end up in landfill. I would rather me go and reuse it. And I would rather not support the continued production of single use items and, you know, fabrics and materials that are just plastic and that are, and what's the labor supply chain. And I mean, it's, it's endless. Like it's, it's a huge thing, but I really commend you for speaking it and speaking truth, even though you're sort of still in it and you're still figuring out and you're still on that journey. And I feel like every single day I'm on that journey myself as well of like, what can I do better today? Like, how can I start to create new patterns, new habits that are more serving of this entire existence and experience that we're having, the planet, the people, the animals, all of it. And am I doing work in the world as well that is actually perpetuating a better world or is it perpetuating you know, the status quo or is it actually, you know, bad for things? So it's, it's a freaking, it's a rabbit hole and a half for sure. But I think it's so many of us are starting to wake up to all of this or have woken up to it and are questioning things and soul life balance seems to be, you know, and in Charles Eisenstein's concept of interbeing seems to be the antidote. I was think, I think convenience is the the enemy of our times in a lot of ways and cultivating a relationship with patience is like incredibly important because we don't have it. And, and a relationship with really looking at, like you said, the blanket that you had around you, you know, you might only truly actually need one blanket for life to keep you warm. <laughs> if you cared for it enough, do we really need the 50 sweaters that are in the or jackets or whatever that we've owned and continue to own? And, you know, I'm, I'm so far from perfect, but this stuff is you know, very passion, very passionate for me. Or sneakers. Yeah. I'm <laughs> guilty here. Yeah. Sneakers. I, I, do, I will say I have this pair of Converse that I'm wearing today. They got holes in them. I, I was thinking about it the other day. I think they're about 10 years old. So, you know, I'm proud of that. <laughs> well, yeah, I like, I have a big collection of sneakers that I just <laughs> bought, to be honest, during the pandemic, because I was working in another place where I was commuting, very toxic place. So I was trying to fill my 
the a hole with sneakers. Yeah. So now I have an entire collection of sneakers. And the whole but, commute, yeah. if you think about the commute that everyone yeah. did today, you were flying by billboards, stores, just selling you stuff all day yeah, long, exactly. selling you things exactly. that you could buy to carry on your commute to your cubicle so that people could look at you with your fancy handbag and your pretty shoes just so you could sit in a cubicle all day with the right what a, what on they, so that you look yeah. a certain way. Like, I mean, there's so much. It's so deep. <laughs> or they can look down on you just just yes. having those those items or stuff like that because sometimes I used to go to work and didn't feel very tired of, of actually working but very tired of everything that I was seeing on the road the actual traffic the people the rush the everything yeah mm -hmm. I would like to move forward to to the next question since we we kind of touched a bit about the burnout topic do you think burnout is actually rooted in our disconnection to our souls rather than it being just like physical or emotional exhaustion? For me, I think it is. Yeah, it's because the only way that we can operate at the pace that we operate at that causes burnout is disconnection. If we were truly connected and honoring what we need, just like the rhythms and cycles of nature, we would rest when we were tired because we would feel it. You know, we would say, oh, this whole situation is, is really stressful. So I'm going to change it and move away from it as soon as I identify that. But everything, the, something that I think about is like the rate of technology and the rate that technology has advanced. We have not, there's no possible way for humanity to evolve, to be able to cope with that. Like it's. That would be millions of years of human evolution to cope with the level of inputs that we have every day. And we've had 20 years. So, you know, most of us here on this call were born into a world with much lower inputs, much lower pace of everything. And in our lifetimes alone, we've had to try to catch up. And, and the only way to do that is to be disconnected from all of what's going on around us and outside of us so that we can keep going like robots essentially. But as soon as we start to tap into like not being a robot and being one with everything around us, then why would we want to live that way? It is not a way to live. It's not living. So I, I think it's deeply rooted in a disconnection from, from self. And I know for myself last year, for example, because I did have this burnout again, I was just like, not sleeping very well, using coffee to, to get through my days. And I kept telling the story to myself, I just need to get through this month. I need to get through this week. I need to get through this period that we're in right now. And as soon as I'm on the other side of it, I'll look after myself again. I'll go back to yoga. I'll get on top of my diet. I'll get on top of my sleep. And that's such a trap. And it's such a sneaky little trap because it starts with like, oh, it's a bit it's a bit busy right now. It's a bit intense, it's a little stressful, but it's, it's just for right now. Like we'll get through it. Next thing you know, you've been telling yourself that for, you know, a year or six months or whatever it is. And that, that's what happened to me again. I just got totally burnt out. And the commitment I'm making to myself now is no, like I, I have to come first so that I can actually show up for this world and not be perpetuating burn it. Because if I just show up like that every day, I'm, I'm modeling to my son, this is how you have to be. I'm modeling to my community. I'm modeling to everyone. Like, you know, you just got to push everything down and, and, and forward no matter what. Like, that's not, that's not it as well. And I think about having a very strong passion and vision and commitment was kind of, it, it also, it was a little bit of a blind spot for me. Like I thought, well, this passion, this vision, this mission I have for my company is like so important. It takes importance and priority over everything else. But realizing that that is a zero sum game because eventually I fall off a cliff in burnout and I can't do the the vision and the mission anyway. So it's like, yeah, we got to be connected with ourselves. I think. Yeah, Sarah, that resonates everything so much. And there's a lot of things that come up for me, one of which is this morning, I'm out in California. So at the time of this recording, we started at 10 a.m. 
And I'm trying my best to get back in the yoga studio, which fortunately the studio I go to and teach to most of their classes are an hour and a half. And when you are in this, what I call hustle season, you know, an hour and a half seems like a long time and you're in 60 minutes is enough. But that said this morning, my partner goes on a walk, right? And we're in Capitola, California. And for those of you that may not know, the president Joe Biden came out and visited us last week because of the storm damages that were so bad. And we are eight minutes, eight minute walk away from those damages from the ocean of the storm that wrecks the pier, wrecks the restaurants and shops and so much. Having said that this morning, sunny and clear, right? Beautiful day. We've been having storms and we typically don't get that weather. You know, usually it is pretty mellow. So it's sunny and clear morning. Partner asked me if I want to go on a walk with her. I'm like, no, I'm on my computer in the kitchen, drinking my coffee, working on social media posts, responding at emails. And I know in the moment that, man, this is how I used to be before I was on this path. And something around the chat here is I've been telling myself for the past year or so, oh, this is hustle season. So when you say, Sarah, like, you know, it, Having it be like, oh, the, for me, I call it hustle season. Yes, I'm passionate about what I'm working on, getting the message out. And that's like, for me, at least my way of justify my lack of putting myself first and my inner world. And when I'm working on these social media posts this morning, you know, I'm just like dialed in and I finish, I go wash the ditches. I'm looking outside. I'm like, man, it's such a beautiful morning. And she, my partner, she's not even back yet. She must have had such an incredible time. She, oh man. Now I start shitting on myself. I, sh oh, I should have gone with her. What am I doing? Now I'm going, you know, all this stuff. So there is so much of a always coming back to ourselves. And one thing, just going back to soul life balance, when we hear work life balance, we think of it as a future state. We think one day I will achieve this future state. But soul life balance, what I like to say is it's really a practice of awareness. It's knowing that we're never going to get there. You know, it's like Matthew McConaughey's Oscar speech, if you guys have seen that, right? But it's, it's always coming back to just awareness around how you're being now and then making those subtle shifts and, you know, trying our best to not be so hard on my, on ourselves. As I look at Amazon package right here from the Amazon brand, you know, cause I'm totally guilty of that as well. And something that I'm working on and it's hard because your quote of, I wrote it down, convenience is the enemy of our times is so powerful. It's so true. It really is. In terms of burnout, another thing I wanted to say as well is like, I'm in a newish relationship. We moved in together. She's got a six-year-old and our six-year-old is in kindergarten. And I was just thinking a few days ago, and Sarah and I kind of had this conversation recently about raising children. But I was just thinking a few days ago, like, wow, like for kindergarten right now, her school schedule is 930 to two or something like that. And then two weeks after winter break, like a three week winter break, they have the schedule for this entire week right now of 8.15 to 1130 for the whole week. And it's like, what kind of structure is a six year old supposed to have if they're going from like, not like three weeks off, they're just entering school for the first time in their life. And they were used to nine to two. And right after having three weeks off, you're having them go to eight to 11. And then I'm starting to think like, okay, well, this is interesting looking at our working hours. Yes, there's all kinds of different types of businesses and things like that. But talking, I guess, more corporate or whatever, when we're saying eight to five or eight to eight, whatever it might be, it's like, well, why don't we just give ourselves more time? I know a lot of tech companies before the pandemic would be like, you know, engineers, things like that, you know, come in at 10, 12, whatever, work late. And it's really about output versus the hours you put in. And for children, I know I have so many thoughts here. I'm not really packaging it nicely, but that's besides the point. For children, I was thinking like, it is so powerful that right now, our six-year-old goes to kindergarten at 9.30 versus at 8 or 8.30 p.m. start because most mornings we go walk down the beach and I understand not everyone lives at the beach, but I mean, going on a walk as a family outside, bonding as a family versus rushing to get up, rushing to get the kid together, rushing to get them to school. And it, like, it doesn't make any sense. You should have that time to bond with your child and create that connection 
So all of these things play a role into burnout and it all relates to not having the emotional connection, you know, the spiritual connection, all the things. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's like thinking about school, like this is just kindergarten. And then where does it go from here? Then it's like regular school. And sometimes there's like preschool activities and after school activities. And then there's weekend sports. And I've heard from so many parents in the mainstream system that they're just, it's just like a full-time job, freaking rushing the kids around. And then they got homework and assignments and that's just conditioning them for a life of disconnection and burnout because that's not like I don't feel what kids should be doing, you know, during their developmental years, like rushing, 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 jam packing, jam packing, schedules, bells, line up, do this, do that. As everybody says, like with no time to, like you said, Sam, go for a walk in the morning and just relax and enjoy the start to the day and have a look at the sun rising and look, listen to the birds and you know, the more that we are in this rush, 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 the, it's so easy to be completely disconnected from nature. I wanted to touch on like the hustle season that you said, because I do, I do feel that we have different seasons in life. And I do feel that it's not necessarily a bad thing when work is really filling us up and we're maybe in a creation and a birthing phase of something. And we're really bringing it to life. You know, it's not to say that there isn't a season for focusing our attention on that. Just like when we first have a child, I really encourage, you know, I have a two-year-old almost and have learned so much from transitioning my journey from maiden to mother and and stepping into parenthood. Like there is a season where I need to rest and be with my child when I'm recovering from birth and when I'm bonding and making that nurturing experience with my child. Like we do have these seasons in life where different things take priority. And that hustle season of creating something professionally can be really fulfilling. It can really give us a lot of energy. It can really liven us up. But it's such a fine line. You know, it's such a fine line of when it tips over to now stressful, needing to meet expectations, not wanting to let anyone down, wanting to be enough. We've set a rod for our own back a lot of the time by like the momentum that we've put forward. Now we have to meet the same demands. We have to post the same amount of things on social media. We have to have the same amount of appointments. The email inbox is full every day because last month, you know, we had all this energy to put all that stuff out there. And now it's all coming back to us. And it's like, go, 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 go. And it's, I think it's just really challenging to uh, manage that line for me, at least between where it goes from this, like very enlivening, enriching, energizing experience to like, oh, now I'm being, now it's draining the life out of me. And I'm still labeling it potentially hustle season. I'm still making an excuse for why I'm still doing it. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. And that's, that's kind of what I was saying with the social media posts, like the, to your point of the fine line, like the, I need to not do that essentially and you know do my things first versus like wake up and get straight to the computer so yeah totally agree and that's for me everyone's gonna be different you know yeah yeah the time on the screen should be like limited i had like i observed when i in times when i didn't work that much but i used to wake up and just go and search for my like go on social media immediately as I woke up I was feeling like very tired all day even though I wasn't working that much so absorbing information from the like early in the morning is definitely not the way to go you both talked about a bit about your experiences with burnout if you were to name one thing that you learned from this journey what would that be Hmm. Well, what I'm focusing on right now is paying attention to my nervous system and really cultivating a relationship with it so I can feel when it's ticking over into that. Because once again, the line between, it's like, have you heard about like anxiety and excitement? They feel very similar in our body. And I, I feel like it's kind of the same thing. Like, where am I? in that excitement creation kind of heightened state because things are coming alive and when does it transition to like stress and I'm activated because I'm like hustling and rushing and and all of that and how quickly is my nervous system able to return to homeostasis and am I like sleeping and truly feeling rested and the feeling of being energized from 
a restful existence is really different to the feeling of being energized from stress and coffee and like the pressure to go, go, go. And so for me, it's the lessons that I'm taking is cultivating a deeper relationship with my body and how it feels when it's in a more peaceful, underlying peaceful state. And I I realized like I hadn't had a break for a long time. And so I've been scheduling in now at least one week off every quarter, but I just did three days in silence, water fasting at our land alone on the land from the 1st to the 4th of Jan. And it was incredibly powerful. And I, I slept a lot because as soon as I took away my phone and my communications with anyone and didn't have to be anything for anyone for just three days, I freaking collapsed. Like I just, I had no energy for anything and I just slept a lot. And it was really different to what I was expecting. I was going out there thinking I was going to like meditate and have all this enlightenment and Actually, it was it was pretty hellish, you know. I had I had a lot of ruminating thoughts and a lot of yucky, ugly stuff coming to the surface, and I was freaking exhausted. Like I could I couldn't barely walk from here to the other side of my little tiny camper without having to have a five minute rest halfway. And that really showed me, like, holy shit, you you are exhausted. And so I've learned those practices of disconnection, you know, the daily practices, but also some bigger regular disconnects, whatever that looks like, you know, for anyone. It doesn't have to be silence, water fasting in nature, but whatever it might be where we actually take all of that away from ourselves, everything that we live for, take it out and just be is going to help deepen that connection with myself. So those are my, that's my big learning. Yeah, that really resonates, Sarah. It brings up a book, I think it's called 12 Week Year, and they talk about breakout blocks. I believe what they say is like maybe once a quarter, once a month, whatever it is, to schedule like four to six hours during traditional business hours for yourself. Like which that is very powerful in itself to take when you quote unquote should be working that time for yourself versus like the weekends or after hours. What you said about like the getting out and land with the the stillness and silence. We were both in fit for service and mastermind together and they did a soul wanders and a soul wander essentially is like a mini, 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 mini vision quest, like three to five hours at like much smaller, even than what you did for three days. And I've done it like three times over the years and every single time I fall asleep <laughs> and I'm like, I shame myself for it, but it, it kind of did feel that. I need that rest. And it definitely clicked for me hearing you speak that it's like, well, yeah, you know, throughout my life, how many times have people been like, you're on three books a year? Like, how are you able to do something? I'm like, it's my VAs. I'm not doing it. You know, I'm doing the stuff that requires my skill set. It's like, no, I actually am doing a lot. So it does make sense hearing you say that, that, that might be part of my experience that way as well. To answer the question, I forgot exactly what the question is, but I wrote down my answer. So I wouldn't forget it's awareness and feed my soul. So it's really, you know, for me, how many times throughout the way can I bring awareness to how I'm feeling in that moment? And my mental chatter, like, although it might seem to some people like it's very chaotic, it's actually pretty clear, you know, it's not that chaotic because it's just asking myself, what do I need to feed my soul? What do I need to love myself? What do I need in this moment? Right. And the example earlier about like when I woke up and went straight to the computer, That's where I'm working on not having it be a reflection later on, whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes later of being like, oh, how was that? Like that's, that's good. And I practice that. But if I can be even more present to be doing these social media posts, as soon as I wake up and be like, why, why am I doing this? And just no, you don't need to do this. And then the second part about feeding my soul and whatnot, for example, yesterday, you know, it was King Tide out here. So we went and explored, you know, the different critters out there. And that's the stuff that lights me up, having that balance to like, go do that. Today, I'm going to skip a call that's a recurring call that I'm paying money to be a part of, like a mastermind type call to go see my partner's 92-year-old, 91-year-old great great grandmother, the kid's great grandmother, because she's in town, you know, things like that. Or this afternoon, again, the weather's good. It's king tide, meaning that it's low tide and you can explore and the weather's good after all these storms had a podcast scheduled. I reschedule it. And I told the guests like, 
Hey, hope you understand, but the weather's really good. And I want to be with my family and like go out and check out what's going on. Cause at the end of the day, like I don't need to record that podcast today, <laughs> you know, and there, how many times do we get caught up in something, whether it's work related or not, but it's like, Oh, need to do this. And it's like, well, do you really like, it's not always the massive things in our society. It's the small shifts. Like what I'm going to take away from this conversation is big time, my consumption. I have a chapter in my book about consumerism, you know, and materialism. And they say that your mess is your message. And it's, it's not lost on me that, you know, I'm still battling with materialism and consumerism. And, you know, the amount of Amazon packages I get on a weekly basis is nuts. Sarah commented on my backdrop here. I have three different lights that I have sitting, not in boxes, but I bought them on Amazon. And what I'm doing, I feel better about it because I'm doing research before I get it. And I'm watching YouTube videos on these three different lights on how I can make my lights better. So it's not just like, oh, let me buy that because it's easy. But when I get here, it's like, well, that didn't work how I thought. Well, let me just go return those and get another. And I don't do as well a job as I would like to practice what I preach in that, in that regard. And then taking a step further, it's like for what anyways, you know, so I can look good and get more social media followers and people can think I'm a professional, right? So there's, you can just keep going and unpacking the layers and go deeper and deeper. But I think of any of these, this stuff, it's always important to come back to like, our intentions behind it, you know, and really if we're doing it for someone else, if we're doing it for our external validation or not, and sometimes it's okay. Cause I mean, you know, for me, I'm just thinking as I speak now, like I do want to have a professional background. I do want to be perceived as like, you know, whatever. And that is a little bit of external validation, but to Sarah's point as well, talking about like hustle season being a good thing in some regards or like, you know, when you're passionate, all this type of stuff, say, if I really want to build this out, I, I need to play the game, right? There's another chapter in my book. What is it called? It's like how to be in the matrix, but not of it, right? Because we are playing the game. So we can't necessarily just disconnect. And some of us might be able to, that's not my path though, personally. So yeah, lots of thoughts, just like kind of thought vomiting, but I hope that kind of brought some value in. I like thinking about like, how do we start to redefine the game and redefine the rules? Like you canceling the podcast and rescheduling. It's I'm really grateful that, and I think remote work is what's really pushing it because everyone got forced into remote work and so we became more normalized that like oh shoot like my kids thing got canceled so I'm now not available this afternoon or you know something happened and because everybody was dealing with it instead of just this very small minority of people who were working remotely it normalized we actually have lives outside of work and sometimes other things are going to take priority or things are going to come up we actually rescheduled this entire webinar because I was burnt out And I hit a point that week where I was like, I just can't, I just can't do it. Like I'm just in the midst of all of this chaos and I'm really stressed and really struggling. And I'm so much happier that we did that because we're having a really rich, enlivening conversation right now. And I wouldn't have been able to bring that when, when we actually decided to reschedule and look, the world is still turning, you know, everything still goes on and obviously it sucks to reschedule and we apologize to everyone and you know, what have you, we're, we're here doing it now. But I think the examples that we can set every day of honoring ourself over and above a potential previous commitment, if it's not serving in that moment, and that's not to say to just willy-nilly back out on all your commitments. I think it's important balance in life to have things that we're committed to and to honor that. But we start to then cultivate a practice of you know, what do we commit to? I mean, I used to overcommit. I just used to say yes to everything and anything. And then I had the story that, well, I have to, I'm a professional, I'm a business person. You know, I've got to go to these events, these breakfasts, I've got to speak at these functions. Ah, And over the years I've learned like keeping my commitments to a minimum so that I can hopefully meet them almost all of the time and having, allowing for more flexibility to honor how I might be feeling in a day. I was just talking to a girlfriend who's coming to visit the US for a month. And she was asking me what she should do. And I was making all of these suggestions and giving her ideas of where she could stay and what she could book. And she ended up writing back to me. 
I'm so overwhelmed. I'm just going to book a car for a month and accommodation in Austin to start with. And I'm just going to build it as I go. And I was like, I think that's the best option. That's how I live my life. Like I can't handle over scheduling of things because chances are on that day, I won't want to actually make that plane flight or go on that trip or do that thing. So where possible, I really try to have foresight about making as little commitments as possible and allowing space for me to, even if I get invited to an event, I say, oh, that sounds amazing. You know, if it's, if it's an unticketed thing or there's more, I ask, like, is there flexibility for me to tell you on the day if I can come? And if there's not, like, I get that. That's not always possible. That's not always the case. And then I weigh out whether I want to make the commitment or not, but where possible, if I can wait and to see how I'm feeling that day before going, just works a lot better for me. I mean, I, I'm a woman, I have a period every single month, my cycle is shifting, not to mention all of the other things that could be going on for me, but I'm an emotional being and things are changing all the time for me. So I want to be able to honor where I'm at on any given day where possible. Yeah, Sarah, that, that totally resonates. I mean, you know, we, you just look at the animals out there, right? We are animals, but like, you know, for me, I'm very connected to water. That's why I moved to the beach, to the ocean. And when I first moved out here, a lot of times I would look at like the seals and when the seals pop up and they look up at the sky, you know, and they kind of just are staring and I'm like, man, what are they thinking? You know, or like when they kind of look at you and then they go dive back in or you're paddle boarding near some otters, but like we are the only ones that have these schedules, right? And this is where I'm passionate now about this new thing, Structured Flow, which is a new integration program I put together for people that are going through a spiritual awakening to provide them a roadmap at the best that you can, because there is no roadmap. But that said, like we are in the game and we need to have structure to a certain extent. And I've been so mindful in the past few years as well about not over committing and things like that as well. And it, it is so challenging to just specifically looking at work and business as opposed to personal obligations to make these commitments with work alone. And then on top of that, you, you to your point, parties, events, things like that, the personal ones as well. And like you want, we should be able to live so that we can be in the moment and not be restricted because of prior commitments. And it is a little bit of a paradox because we also do need to plan in the head certain things more than others though. So yeah, that really resonates. Well, I think about the seals and it's not like they're like, oh, it's 9am on Wednesday. I have to hunt. They're just like, I'm hungry. I'll go find some food or like, oh, the tides brought a bunch of food in that's easy picking. I'll go grab it. Like, oh, the sun's out. I'm going to lay around in this sun because that seems like a good thing to do right now. They're not like, oh, Thursday, 4 p.m. It's time for sunning my body. Like, oh, bummer. The sun's not out. I'll do it anyway because it's Thursday at 4 p.m. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would like to continue this discussion about burnout and also conclude it. I think most of us here have stumbled upon the news that Cinda Arden resigned as the Prime Minister of New Zealand. She shared very kindly that her reason for doing so was burnout. Is the ultimate leadership quality knowing when you're in it and when to step back to reconnect and recharge, also in this way leading the way for others to do the same? Yes, I totally agree. I'll defer to Sarah to expand because she wrote the book on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I don't know a lot about her or her political, you know, what she's done or hasn't done and not necessarily a supporter or a not supporter. I, I really don't know anything about it, but I did hear that she resigned and, and read something about her doing that for burnout. And I, I did think that's freaking awesome. You know, it really is. It's awesome to have someone who's at that level, you know, the, in our matrix 3D reality, like, I don't know, what is the most serious position someone can hold? The leader of a country, like it seems very serious and very important and a lot of commitment and a lot of obligation and to realize and honor the fact that it's still a human, you know, it was still born a baby, breastfed, grew up, went to school, did all the things that every other human did. And it's still just one I'm saying it, you know, what, whatever, man or woman, like it's still 
just a person holding this position and that person can still decide that it's no longer the thing that they want to do and step away. And I think moving to a world where we are more honoring of ourselves, irrespective of the position we're in, knowing that there will always be someone else who can step up and step in, who has fresh energy, fresh perspectives, is ready to take on that you know, commitment, responsibility. I think cultivating more of a relationship with that is very, very important for our society. I think we've honored this kind of loyalty and commitment and obligation for such a long time. And I think it's time to start honoring nature and what we really need. We are nature. You know, it's not human beings and nature. We are nature. We've just believed a story for quite some time, a subtle conditioning that we're not nature, we're separate from it. And so we operate differently, but it's not actually true. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think as leaders, it's important to lead by example, just in general, but to Sarah's point, when you are on the biggest stage and like the biggest role of quote unquote power, that is how we make these changes because it gives permission for others to do the same. And, you know, I'm American. I've never lived outside of California even. And I've heard from different people that are, have moved here from other countries, how much like Americans pretend like everything is good on the surface. And I remember after my first ayahuasca plant medicine ceremony back in 2019 for like weeks, maybe months, I was like, no more surface level conversations. Just that's why I started my podcast soul seeker. Cause I want to go below the surface and we do all pretend that things are good. And I forget who it was, but recently, maybe like two weeks ago, maybe it was three weeks ago. Oh, now I remember who it was. Shout out to Chris Hager. Sarah knows him. And he mentioned to me how like someone asked him how he was doing and he just told them how he was doing. And I won't go in depth of his story, but you know, they, there's so much truth to that. How many times when someone asks, how are you doing? Like, yeah, oh, good. And there's a time and place for that. Like, you know, the other day at yoga studio, see someone I don't really know, but we know each other. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Okay, now it's time to go. You know, but it would be nice if we did slow down, actually have a conversation. When you're with someone and there's the time and space to expand on how you're doing, Oftentimes it is just good or, oh, not so good. Like you don't really go deep. And in terms of mindful leadership, when I speak to corporate and when I just speak in professionally, especially when it's a business demographic, one of the things that I bring in, in terms of mindful leadership is the practice of a wiffle. And a wiffle is an acronym that stands for what I feel like expressing. And this is one of the easiest ways to like bring accessible mindfulness into corporate where before you start a meeting, you let your team know that you're going to be conducting a wiffle over time when it's the same members that you don't need to tell them every time what it is, but it's just the time and space to connect before you drop into the meeting of like, Hey, if anyone has something that's keeping them away from being fully present in this meeting, we're creating time and space now to talk about that. And oftentimes it's not deep. In fact, it's probably better if it's not depending on your culture, but it's the type of thing like, oh, I had a really chaotic morning and, you know, my coffee spilled or my kid was crying, whatever. So, you know, I'm just kind of stressed from that. And when you say that, whatever the thing is, all of a sudden others can see you, right? And they can be like, oh, not starting to create stories of Sam is this, Sam is that. It's like, no, he's actually dealing with his own shit. It's a reminder that we're all dealing with our own stuff, right? And then it gives permission to others as well to be more vulnerable. So utilizing the acronym WIFL, what I feel like expressing, is just a really easy and accessible way to bring a little bit more mindfulness into any corporate culture. Yeah. And I think sometimes just saying that one thing, like, oh, I had a hell of a morning or, you know, my partner and I are just going through some stuff and it's a lot, like you don't have to go into it, but you've just said it. A lot of times just saying it releases the charge. So you can also focus on the meeting because you're no longer focusing on, oh, I don't want my colleagues to know that I'm stressed out. I don't want them to know that I'm tired. They'll think that I'm dropping a game. Like there's so much energy that goes into the mask. And if you can just put the mask off and say, yeah, like I'm going through some tough stuff, you're a little bit more freer. And ironically, it ends up meaning most of the time that you can just focus. And in the instance where it's something really big and really difficult, 
you know, maybe it's just opening up a little space for a one-on-one conversation with the right person later to help you manage life and work at that time. Because sometimes, you know, if you're going through something really big, the idea of not at least letting people know that something's going on is it really, you know, can be really detrimental because whenever somebody's not showing up at work in the way that they normally do, people are going to be wondering they're going to be creating stories of why oh they're not they don't like their job anymore they're looking for other work or they're this they're that whatever it might be and once again just so much energy going into that we do three collective breaths at the start of our meetings and then we usually do depending on how big the group is just like a one word or a one sentence opener of how you're feeling and even just that of saying exhausted i'm stressed oh, I'm super excited. We just bought a house. Like whatever it is, is just reminding everyone that we all have lives outside of this. We're all coming in to this moment in time with different past, like whatever was just happening is not the same for all of us. So I don't come in super excited that I just bought a house and go, why isn't everybody else all excited? And meanwhile, well, somebody's going, just had a fight with their partner or their kid. Like, that's why they're not excited. Like we we have blinders on oftentimes and how we feel is sort of how we start to see the world around us. But when we can remember like, oh, this is what's happening for me, but X, Y, Z is happening for all these other people. And we can just then clear all of that and drop into what we need to in the media. It works really well for us. So I really like that whiffle. It's a good, it's a good tactic, good technique. I feel like I was going to say something else, but I forgot. It'll come back if it was important. <laughs> yeah. Ours is fast-paced world, especially in the business world. So how can we truly thrive as leaders without betraying our souls or sacrificing our mental health? Yeah. <laughs> how, how can it, we what as leaders? I miss that. Thrive. Really thrive. thrive. Oh, okay. Without sacrificing our soul. I do believe that it is through this practice of soul life balance. And it's, it is pretty simple. You know, it's just having the awareness to connect with ourselves, to ask, what do I need? What, what, what do I need to do, feel whatever, and pause and listen for those answers. And it, it's that simple could expand from there, but I mean, let's not overcomplicate, overcomplicate things. I, I do something called a goals poster and it's like the, the bridge between vision boards and setting goals. And I haven't done it for like four years. And I just printed it out and posted it up yesterday. It's to my left. And it literally says spirituality simplified. That's like the title of my goals poster, because at the end of the day, like so many times, and I know I'm making this a spiritual answer kind of it wasn't, but at the end of the day, we do tend to overcomplicate things as humans and whatever it might be And this, this, movement this way of being this practice of soul life balance is pretty simple and and most things are pretty simple so if we can just check in with ourselves by asking a couple questions about how am i feeling what do i need you know how can i love myself if it's something like that i know that's big in my journey that's an easy way to show up and thrive as leaders because we need to make sure that we're quote unquote putting our metaphorical oxygen mask on first and really filling our cup up first so for me that's what comes up yeah for me it's and I think it's probably unique for everyone so it's like getting to know yourself and what is most important for me it's like living in my truth and expressing my truth so whenever I'm showing up in a way that I think is how I should be showing up I'm not thriving It's when I'm actually showing up as my fullest expression of who I am, whatever that is in that moment, maybe I don't have the answers and I'm stressed and I'm struggling. Like if that's my fullest expression, when I can have the courage to do that, I'm thriving. When I'm trying to hold everything so tightly to protect my team, to protect myself, to protect my image, that's when I'm really not thriving and I'm in much more of a survival mode. My nervous system is more activated. So like on my own journey, it's all been unpacking layers of being enough, being worthy, being worthy to exist, being, being okay with whatever meaning, you know, this worthiness to exist is like very deep for me. It's like, I've had to create a meaningful life to be worthy of this existence. And I've used external validation points to tell me okay, like what you're doing is meaningful. So you're worthy. So you can exist. Like it's very deep. 
But I think that that journey of uncovering those aspects of ourselves so that we can let them go and be our fullest expression of truth in any moment, that for me is where I'm actually thriving and where I'm most free. I'm not free when I'm trying to show up in a way that I think is how I should show up because of the title I hold, because of the situation I'm in, because of the people I perceive to be relying on me or needing me. Like, All of that is just stories and constructs in my mind. And the more that I can let go of them and just be my fullest expression in my life in any situation is where I'm thriving. Thank you. My last question is of this conversation is actually inspired by a TV series I'm currently watching. It's a fantasy show called His Dark Materials where human souls are represented by animals who talk, called demons, and each human has its own demon. It is said that this bond is sacred, and if they grow estranged, for both suffer immense pain. And if separated, they both die. And for me, seeing the soul actually graphically represented, it was a very interesting feeling. Because when you have that graphic representation, you become more aware of the connection we should have and the, the the bond we have with our souls. So my question is and comes as a conclusion to this whole conversation, how can we be more in tune with our souls? And if you can share how each of you come in more tune with your soul. I want to watch that show. It's amazing. I'm already of the, it has like three seasons. It's on HBO. Now, is it like about shadow work? Like the shadow integration? It's or? about a lot of things. Yeah. You, you can, yeah. yeah, you should watch it. <laughs> I totally it like it. so interesting. Yeah, sure. And you can find it on HBO. It has religion, politics, I Ching, shamans, yeah. everything. Dark matter. Well, so, yeah. I mean, what comes to me and my mind has gone to like shadow work and integration of self, but I think, you know, understanding that we do all have all of these different aspects of ourself and working toward integrating them versus keeping them in the shadows. So understanding that I have like these really light, beautiful aspects of myself, but I also have dark shadowy aspects of myself things that show up when I'm under stress under pressure when I think I'm not worthy and how can I bring those things that I put in shame that I push away that I don't want to look at into the light and integrate them more into myself I mean it's a deep exploration of of who I am but also who is this collective you know all of this stuff is also in the collective so I don't know if that's a very simple or I'm not sure if everybody's following but that's just where my mind went right away was like the most profound work I've done in my life to understand myself and my soul I suppose is this kind of integrating all of these different parts of myself and honoring them and understanding that sometimes this part shows up you know how like if you ever feel like I find myself saying like one part of me feels like X and this other part of me feels like Y. Like I'm just saying that as an expression, but it's actually true. Like there are, there are two parts of me in a, in a certain situation potentially that are feeling really opposing things. And maybe this part of me like is the light who, you know, wants this higher harmony or whatever, but there's this other part of me that's feeling betrayed and is scared that I can't trust anyone or anything. Like they both exist. So how do I just honor both of them? How do I let them both have a voice? How do I integrate them more so that I can be more of an observer of this experience, which helps my nervous system, my physical nervous system to be more calm and come back to homeostasis and helps me be more in tune with this experience. So for me, it's like in how, how I can integrate and hopefully the rest of our collective, we can start to integrate and heal from all of this collective trauma and past experiences and you know, that's a, it's a whole big thing, but powerful. Yeah. Parts work and internal family systems. I just put a blog a day on chat about that and it's so powerful. What's coming up for me for this one is breath work. And I mentioned that earlier, like a breath work journey where just my breath and I, that's it. Mm-hmm. Whether you're working with a practitioner or not, I recently went through a breath work facilitator training course. So now I'm able to facilitate 
people going deep with their breath and hold space with them and guide them for, you know, about 90, 60 minutes, anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes is so powerful. And this past actually was it about a week and a half ago, I led a men's group at the yoga stu studio I teach at, and we had nine guys show up and we did about 45 or so minute breath work journey. And one guy, I forget what exactly he said, something like he's never had so much clarity and felt so good in like three years or something. And someone else had, like they all had very profound experiences. I'm not going to try to put words to what they said, but it was just blown away and they felt reconnected with their soul. One guy shared that he connected with his sister that had passed a couple of years before and his wife is pregnant and he connected with his baby. And this is someone who, doesn't explore with psychedelic medicines and breath work is so powerful and accessible for all of us. And in terms of work in a corporate culture and environment, like when I speak, I usually lead them through a few minutes of box breathing, you know, nothing deep, just calmly grounding and centering themselves. And I look out into the audience and it astonishes me when I see, you know, the cloudy eyes, the tears that come through because I'm so used to doing medicine ceremonies and the deep, deep work and all this. And sometimes it doesn't need to be that. Sometimes, especially when we are like the bridge for say a more busy, chaotic corporate culture that doesn't have employees that are taking the time to really ask themselves, how are they connecting to their soul? For them, it's as simple as just starting to take a few intentional breaths to slow down. So it really depends where you're at on the journey. But, you know, Sarah put in the chat, I think silence and yeah, silence is so key as well. For me, I would probably say um, breath, just those intentional breaths and it can be anything. It doesn't have to be like a specific form of breath, like a oh, box breathing or alternate nostril breathing, like just slow down, close your eyes and start taking a few breaths, you know? But yeah. Yep, this is it. This is my last question. And I don't see any other questions in the chat unless Laura wants to put a question live. If not, I think we can wrap up. Awesome. Thank you so much for hosting us, Andrea. And thanks, Sam, for joining. It was like a really, really good chat. But... Yeah, this was yeah. awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. I was really excited for this because burnout and in general mental health problems have increased in the last year a lot. I, 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 am, I am sure these problems were existed before, but now we are talking about them and that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you both. Andrea, you're an amazing facilitator, host. Thank you so much. Sarah is always such a pleasure and just grateful for the opportunity. And I'd love to share on my podcast as well. If you guys send me the link, I'll oh, throw yeah, it up on the Soul Seeker podcast. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Here, I always love our conversations, just so rich. And I learn so much and feel like I can contribute as well. So it's a great exchange. Absolutely. Thank you. I agree. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye.